Today, my friends, we are going to tell the tale of Nelly Kershaw, who was a 33-year-old rover, and we'll get into what a rover is shortly in this video. But Nelly worked for a company named Turner Brothers Asbestos here in Rochdale. Then her life will be cut short at the age of 33, down to the job she was doing. And that was handling raw asbestos. So today's tale, we are gonna cover not only the sad death of Nelly, and because of the working condition she was in, but also how she would bring change or her death would bring change to the industry at large. So this, my friends, is the sad and tragic tale of Nelly Kershaw. Nelly Kershaw was an English textile worker, born sometime around 1891. But she holds a significant place in medical history because she was the first documented case of what we call today pulmo pulmonary, I think it is, asbestosis, a disease associated with occupational asbestos exposure. So today we're gonna to delve into Kershaw's life, her tragic struggle with the illness, and her subsequent death. And the legal battles against her employers and the pivotal role that she played in shaping the regulations for the asbestos industry. Now, Turner Brothers Asbestos, or TBA, the mill itself is just over there. And it's absolutely huge, and you can see it carries on. Now for today's video, there's no way we are going to get into the mill itself, simply because it's still contaminated with asbestos. The land all around us and in front of us is to this day contaminated. And I think it's every six months, tests are made. I think it's Environmental Agency and other boards, they come and test just to see just how contaminated it still is. So we're not gonna be making our way into the actual buildings themselves today. However, we do have some drone footage, which I've been given permission to use by two separate YouTubers. So we'll put drone footage over this throughout today's video. Now back in the early part of the 1900s, asbestos on the manufacturing of it expanded massively. And I think at one point, there was around 30,000 tonnes a year of asbestos related materials being produced, manufactured. But we've also got to now remember that back in the early parts of the 1900s, health and safety was non-existent. There were no regulations, there, were no, there was no way of checking and seeing, finding out what harmful effects asbestos was causing to the human body. And this is where today's story starts. And it is about one lady, Nellie Kershaw. Now, Nellie was a 33-year-old, single, as far as I'm aware, at the time, parent. She had one child, a young boy, who was three or three and a half years old. We do know that she was married, but I think during this story and during her final years of her life, she may well have been widowed. I could be wrong. Um, but I do know from all accounts, she did have a, a young boy, like I said, three or three and a half years old. Now, Nelly herself had started working at a young age in the cotton factories. She was a cotton spinner. And sometime round about the 1916, 1917s, and I'll put all the years down below, she started working here at Turner Brothers Asbestos. And she was a spinning, or she was a, a machine rover which involved the handling of raw asbestos. And she was putting this into machinery, which then spun the fine fibres. But it was these fibres that obviously, the, these yarns, which were creating a lot of particles, a lot of dust. So for many months, 
I won't say years, but for many months, she was actually breathing in all this, these loose, these loose particles, these loose fibres. She wasn't the only one. There were many other employees working here at the time. Um, but in the case of Nelly, her story is important because, like I said, right at the very start, she will become the first documented case of asbestos-related diseases. And it will be her untimely death that will lead to massive changes in how not just asbestos, but how hazardous substances will be regulated years after her death. Now, speaking of the dangers to the human body with asbestos, you had men, women and children that entered the asbestos industry completely unaware of the hazardous conditions they were about to set foot in. And like I said, there was no health and safety, there were no concerns of health and safety, and I guess that if there were any talk or any speak of people's health and safety, it would be between the employees themselves, probably during the work breaks. But as for regulations, there was absolutely nothing to, to look after the well-being of employees. So as you can see, guys, just outside on the perimeter fencing of Turner, Brothers asbestos. You've got signs such as this. Danger, hazardous materials keeps the footpath. Dogs must be kept on the lead. Like I said, this, this area here of Turner Brothers is still highly contagious to this day. Well, when I say highly contagious, it, it is there is still parts of it which is contaminated with asbestos fibres. So obviously, as I said, we're not going to travel into the actual building itself and we'll we will put uh, footage over over these segments as we talk, but you can still see there is remnants of old pathways that the workers would have walked up and down all those years ago. We're not going to talk too much about the history itself of the Turner Brothers and when and how the mill shut down. We are talking about the life of Nellie Kershaw in today's video and obviously how her death would impact the future of working regulations for other employees, other workers, like I said, shortly after her death. But this is, um, I think this is known as, is it Healy Dell? It's a, it's a small part of Rochdale. And as you can see, there is a, a public pathway through and around Turner Brothers Mill. So we're going to keep to the path for today's, today's video and we'll keep out of harm's way. After spending around three years with the Turner Brothers Asbestos Company, Nelly began to show symptoms, signs of asbestos related ill health. She started struggling with her breathing. Her chest was, com it was tight, completely saturated with all these fine particles of asbestos dust. She suffered from headaches, thirst, she possibly was, at the time, losing weight. She may well have been coughing up blood. She may have also had small little bumps starting to appear just on the chest cavity, or just under the skin. All symptoms, all signs of asbestos-related illnesses. I think it was around about 1920, like I said, just after these illnesses started to occur, that Nelly herself, she went to see a local GP and the GP himself would write to or he would sign a medical certificate and one would presume that is some kind of sick note in today's terminology 
but she got this medical certificate and she took time off work. Now this medical certificate would be handing in to the, obviously the people in charge of well-being at Turner Brothers. And basically she was asking for help while she was off work. She wanted paying some sick pay while she was off work. Turner Brothers themselves turned this request down. They didn't even entertain the idea that what she was suffering from had been caused whilst working for themselves. So now again, just hidden, just off the side of the pathway, you've got another hazardous, another hazardous sign. And that is on the opposite side of where the mill, the factory is. Turner Brothers is just over there. We've walked along this path and you've got the hazardous sign on this side. So I'm not sure just how contaminated these parts are. Perhaps people, when they come through this way, like myself and Vicky, we should be wearing some kind of face masks. I don't really know, but uh, I presume I presume people wouldn't be allowed to walk up here, would they? Yeah, people wouldn't be allowed to walk up here if it was that uh, if it was that bad. And look, you've got another one just coming up here. So again, all these warning signs placed everywhere. And Vicky's just asking about this wall here, this outer perimeter. Well, I mean, the actual Turner Brothers Mill, it's massive. I mean, you, you, we've seen it from that side of the pathway, but it literally does cover large sections. And over this segment, I will place a little bit of footage, some drone footage, um, and I'll tag the person responsible for that footage down below guys so you you please go along and visit the channel like i said we do have two youtube creators who've kind of collabed with this video today by allowing us the use of their own footage one's a drone shot or drone footage and the other footage is basically some urban explorer who's gone inside the actual abandoned mill itself um, but like I said, they've kindly allowed us some footage or use of their footage to show you guys exactly what it is like now inside Turner Brothers. Or, like I said, it, it'll give you guys some kind of idea as to, well, the scale of the, the, the place. Because like I said, it's massive from looking at it from the outside. Now, Nelly's GP was a, was a doctor by the name of Walter Joss. And on the actual medical certificate, he had stated that Nelly was unable to follow her occupation as a result, as he would state, as being from asbestos poisoning. Now, like I said, Nelly took this medical certificate to the New Bold Approved Society, or NAS. But her application for benefits was refused. And it's simply because the doctor had written down the words asbestos poisoning. Now advisors and the legal entities that worked on behalf of the Turner brothers, they simply had their get out of jail card there right in front of them. All simply because of the words asbestos poisoning. And again, you've got more cobbles that are started to show themselves again. Now with the Turner brothers having their get out of jail card, again with the word in asbestos poisoning, they would give three reasons as to why they would take no responsibility of Nelly's condition. And it was also under the Workmen's Compensation Acts that they were going to use as their defence. Now they would say that asbestos was not a poison and asbestos poisoning, it was not a recognised medical condition. 
They would also state that asbestos poisoning was not a scheduled disease under the terms of the Workmen's Compensation Acts. And finally, Nelly had not suffered an accident whilst at work. So simply put, the Turner brothers would deny any liability for her condition and refusing compensation, claiming it would establish a precedent of responsibility. Now after being off work for nine weeks, and this was back in 1920, Nelly herself would write to the Turner brothers directly, begging for some form of assistance. She would say to them that after being away for nine weeks and being refused any compensation from any establishment, she was struggling financially. She didn't have a penny she couldn't put food on the table for herself and the young child. But yet the Turner Brothers Asbestos Company turned a blind eye to her. They shut down all avenues of help. They simply did not wish to, nor they didn't want to help in any way. Because like I said, if they'd have helped poor Nelly when they should have done, in their own words, it would have set a precedent for future cases against them and we can only now hazard a guess as to possibly how many people may well have suffered from asbestos poisoning whilst working for the Turner Brothers themselves. After two years of struggling financially, mentally, and obviously she was struggling with ill health, Nelly would succumb to the asbestos poisoning on Friday the 14th, 1924. She was just aged 33 years old. And like I said, she left behind a young son who was three or three and a half years old. And in those two years of suffering from ill health and as her health gradually got worse and worse and worse, the Turner brothers never once, from any account that we can find, we can't find anything, but they never once lifted a finger to help Nelly. Now, when Nelly was buried over at Rochdale Cemetery, Again, the Turner brothers, they refused any help financially with that side of things. They didn't help with any preparations for Nelly's funeral. 
they never helped with any funeral costs. And as far as I'm aware, they never helped provide for some form of future, some kind of future for Nellie's young three, three and a half year old son. They washed out their hands of the entire incident. Nellie herself, from what we've read and what we've researched, was buried in an unmarked pauper's grave in Rochdale Cemetery. Now, I am just gonna stray off this path a little bit and go up to these gates. Like I said, I think that like, Vicky had a good point. If, if this was as, as, what's the word I'm looking for? Contaminated. If this was as contaminated as these signs worryingly point out, then obviously this part would be blocked off from public usage. So I'm just gonna look to this gate and We'll take a quick look. We can see it is well secured. I know if you really wanted to get inside, you could do, but for the purpose of the video, we're not gonna attempt that. Let's see if we can get the GoPro through the fence. And there is one side of the Turner Brothers Asbestos Company. Now shortly after Nellie's passing, the coroner for Rochdale, Mr. E. N. Molesworth, initiated a formal inquest. Now he initially attributed her death to pulmonary tuberculosis and heart failure. However, further examinations revealed extensive fibrosis in her lungs, caused indeed by asbestos exposure. And Dr. William Edmund Cook, a pathologist, testified that the mineral particles in her lungs identified as asbestos, and they were undoubtedly the primary cause of her lung fibrosis and subsequent death. Turner Brothers, represented by legal counsel, attempted to evade financial responsibility during this inquest. They also contributed nothing, as I said, to any of Nellie's funeral costs. Now, interestingly, I did come across a report published in 1898 by the Chief Inspector of Factories and Workshops. This was 26 years before the death of Nellie Kershaw and it clearly outlines the concerns of working with asbestos. And like I said, this came 26 years before the death of Nellie. So the warning signs were clearly there. Now these warning signs were written down by the chief inspector and I'll read a short segment out now but simply put she wrote that the evil effects of asbestos dust have also attracted my attention a microscopic examination of this mineral dust was made by HM medical inspector clearly revealed the sharp glass-like jagged nature of the particles and where they are allowed to rise and to remain suspended in the air of a room in any quantity the effects have been found to be injurious as might have been expected. When Nellie's death certificate was issued on the 2nd of April 1924, it cited fibrosis of the lungs due to the inhalation of mineral particles as the cause of death, paving the way for what is now known today as asbestosis. found some structure just over here guys so curiosity's got the better of me check out the graffiti not quite sure what this building is or was 
Let's have a walk around and see what else we can see. So, building of sorts. Wow, that's dark. There's me a geyser just in. I can see some ladder just down there. Door which is sealed. Let's just go back to this one. I have got my torch on me, see if it picks anything up. Ah, it's not strong enough. Yeah, an old ladder there, guys. But uh, cameras, the, the torch itself is just not strong enough. But yeah, interesting nevertheless. Have a look around this side. Now, whilst the news, obviously, of the findings conclusively proving that Nelly had indeed suffered from the effects of asbestosis, and it all came from working for the Turner Brothers Asbestos Company, it was too little, too late for poor Nelly. She never got the help she needed to see out her final two, three, four years. She suffered immensely with great pain for the last two years of her life that we know of. Like I said, all the symptoms were there, but it just progressively got worse. And yet the Turner brothers themselves turned a blind eye to, to any help that she was asking, begging, pleading for. I could kind of see why they didn't want to help because it would have set a precedent, as they said, but still, they should have done the right thing by her. I think from all accounts, and I did read an article about payments being made to asbestos-related diseases, I think between 1931 or 32 up to 1948. And I think it was something like 48 or 58,000 pounds in total, not just with the Turner Brothers, but by other companies. Now, when you put that into comparison with what shareholders received in that same period, and I think it was something between was it 1.7 million or 2.7 million? Again, the figures could be way out, but I did read an article where the figures far outweighed those that obviously what should go to the victims. It's shocking and it goes to show that money goes over health every time with these big companies. As long as they make their profits and they're not, they're not it doesn't matter if it's at the expense of somebody's ill health or life. As long as the shareholders get their divvies, their dividends at the end of each financial year, that is all that they care about. And back in the 1930s, it was exactly the same. Nothing's changed today, guys. Nothing has changed today. I think there's probably more, and there is more regulations in place. I get that. But still, profit comes over everything, every single time. Now, in a... In a... What's the word I'm looking for? Not a sick twist of fate, but in a kind of a final insult to poor Nelly. One of the brothers, Sir Samuel Turner, passed away the same year in 1924, but later on in, in the year, I think it was around about August. And he was also buried at Rochdale Cemetery. Now, whereas poor Nelly, she was buried in a pauper's unmarked grave, she died penniless, and from all accounts, only a couple of people, one or two people turned up to pay the final respects to her. Even mill workers, from all accounts, didn't even bother to pay the final respects. As for Samuel Turner, when he passed away, many hundreds of people 
visited Rochdale Town Centre, they made their way to the town centre just so they could catch a glimpse of Turner's hearse driving past. At the cemetery, Rochdale Cemetery, many more hundreds of people all turned up to watch this grand splendour of a funeral. And I'm not going to knock Samuel Turner himself for that because he did bring a lot of employment to this area along with his brothers. But it just goes to show you, doesn't it, how a woman who suffered from a few years working for the Turner brothers, who suffered from ill health and never received a penny from them, even though, okay, it may not have been a recognised condition back then, doctors certainly said it was most certainly part of her employment that caused these illnesses. The Turner brothers, again, like I said, they turned a blind eye to it. They didn't want to pay out. So she died penniless in a pauper's grave. And yet when Samuel Turner himself passed away, he left behind, from all accounts, half a million pound in personal fortunes. And back in 1924, half a million pound was a hell of a lot more money than what it is today. So it goes to show you the different lifestyles, the different, the different ways this tragedy affected people. Samuel Turner left behind a mass fortune as for poor Nelly, she left behind a three or three and a half year old son, motherless. It does go to show you just how harsh and how wrong life sometimes can be. 2006 April, or April 2006, Memorial Stone was unveiled in Rochdale to commemorate not only Nelly Kershaw, but all asbestos victims worldwide. And this event was organised by the Save Spodden Valley campaign, reflecting the concerns about asbestos contamination on the former Turner factory's site where Kershaw had worked. But Nellie Kershaw's life and untimely death, as we said in this story, it will become a catalyst for change in occupational health and safety regulations. And her case, marked by her employer's denial and legal resistance, it would prompt, like I said, a parliamentary inquiry and the subsequent establishment of industry regulations. So whilst poor Nelly had to suffer alone, suffer penniless until her untimely death, her legacy persists as a reminder of the human cost of industrial negligence and the ongoing fight for workers' rights and safety. And it's a shocking story but I'm glad we've covered it today and we have paid our respects to, to poor Nelly. Now while we're here, we are going to show some footage of some of the nice graffiti, or the neat graffiti, that surrounds the Turner Brothers former mill. And as you can see from this one, probably one of the best so far. So that is all from here in Rochdale and the Turner Brothers Asbestos Company. We hope you've enjoyed today's video. It's been a sad one, but it's also shown just the, the other side of human nature, how companies and shareholders will profit over a human being's health and safety and obviously their lives. Now, if you enjoyed today's video, don't forget to give us a big thumbs up and don't forget to comment on this video. If you are watching this video and you had people that used to work at this former mill, this former factory, comment down below and tell us your stories. Likewise, if you wish to get in touch with us and talk to us more in depth about 
maybe your life's working here or a family member's life's working here for our, our follow-up video or follow-up story contact us via our website at www.daysofhorror.com and we will gladly get back in touch with you guys now in the meantime i want you to take care and look after yourselves don't forget to comment like share subscribe to the channel we'll get more videos coming all the time so if you can do all those things we will greatly appreciate it but in the meantime guys want to take care look after yourselves and myself and vicky will be back soon we know the tale from a dark but at times glorious past. Stay curious, stay safe.